Hello, this is Dwight Norris of FishingAtWork.com, and I'm here again on a Saturday evening, well, hmm, Saturday afternoon, to talk to you about pan fish ice fishing. Now, you've probably seen my previous video, which I'm now uploading right now because I forgot to do it when I was at work, showed me going to the Broad Canal over by MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and getting a big failing grade on fishing because the whole place was rock solid. It was one of those freak days where it went from eight degrees all the way up to 60. And I was like, oh yeah, baby, I'm gonna hit something up today. Ice is melting everywhere. All that snow I piled in the corner is like melted off. I don't have to like pick at it with an, uh, a 40 pound ice pick. Psh, psh, that's what we do up here up in the north when uh, ice forms and we had to get at it get at it but um I showed up and it didn't look so good I could vis visibly see that the depth of the ice based by the cracks was at least five inches and you only need four inches to be safe to actually go like ice skating or ice fishing or even driving your vehicle on the ice so yeah it was ready to go but didn't work out. And then I went out again on another, maybe not great day, it was uh, last weekend. And was it last weekend? It was just a couple days ago. And I had the chance to go out fishing again in the evening. I was like, yes, I'm rocking it. I'm doing this. And I went out there and once again, the only place where the water was showing was exactly where I didn't want to fish. Cause I had spoke briefly about a place I thought bass or really any fish that was hibernating for the winter would be. But I didn't get access to it because it was iced over. You can actually see that here in this video, right? I'll, uh, this is the bridge. If you can go back to my uh, how to use topographic maps for bass, for finding bass, you'll see that I found the bridge and behind it, behind one of the bridge abutments was an 18 foot hole. And before that, the rest of the river all the way up to the dam was around three to six feet so when the river drops by three times into a hole that probably could harbor a, you know a couple hundred fish you gotta try it out and when you do try it out especially in these cold weathers cold weather you need to come correct and that's with live bait at least to try it out and once you know the fish are there then you can try all your other tactics your your big plastic worms your your diving minnows uh, really anything else you want you can try to crayfish whatever jigs doesn't matter depends on what you're trying to target but to get a lay of the land and learn what's there get the live bait try the place out if it's brand new like it was for me and figure out what's there and what's to catch and then you can call the fish one by using lures that are made for that particular type of fish if you get a jig with a big crawfish on it you know a, a bass is going to bite that and maybe if it's extra crazy and the uh, herring run is, is going up here maybe you'll catch a striped bass but other than that small mouth large mouth nothing else and if you're using worm obviously you're gonna get everything and if you're looking for the biggest bass, you're going to go extra large. That's how everybody else is calling fish. And they're doing it in bass tournaments by using extra long and extra huge worms. I'm talking a foot to like 16 inches. There's no worm that I know that, that is that long, but maybe an eel is. Maybe that's why the black color of plastic worm is so popular. There are American eels. And there are freshwater eels as well. And nobody really talks about them for live bait because they're hard to find, hard to catch, and you're not going to get them in your local tackle shop or your bait shop or wherever you get your live bait from in your area. Uh, that being said, you can get this online at Amazon or any other e-commerce vendor or straight direct from a, um, a live bait vendor that sells all types of insects and worms and maybe even amphibians that you can use for your fishing adventure. But, if you want to mimic an eel, a gigantically long 12 inch plus fat worm, you can use uh, really 
all the worm brands have something like that now. It's like the new gimmick, you know, it's like the uh, Ned Rig, which isn't a gimmick. It actually works. <laughs> but this works for culling fish. And if it's, there's a possibility of a eel being in your body of water, that is what's going to tempt those extra large fish to stop being lazy and to bite your hook. So let's take a look at this uh, video I made here of the Charles River right next to the Mount Auburn Hospital and two bow houses on either side. I look at those for a second, but they're not important. The really weird thing was there's something called a, um, a night herring. It's a shorter kind of herring, like a, like a blue herring, the bird, not the fish. And it was just sitting on the boat dock. I only got to a video of it, but I watched it after I stopped the video and I was like, what the heck is he doing over there? It's freezing. Why is he in Florida chilling with the rest of his buddies? But apparently there is some formidable, formidable areas around here where night herrings and blue herrings and other other uh, bird, uh, other fish catching birds can exist until the warm up happens. Maybe they're lazy. Maybe they found someplace warm to hang out and then come out during the day and then go fishing and then they go back to their place and stay warm. Sounds like a good idea to me. Flying for that long, it's got to be painful. So let's take a quick look at this. I know you can't hear it, but uh, it's not important. Yes, right over here was that herring just walking around. In the comments. As you can see, it is very cold and very icy. And see this line here? I didn't actually make that. That's not me. But I was casting right here and I was like, oh, maybe it's deep on the other side of the bridge abutment because the 18 foot hole is on the opposite side over here. This is where it's at. Uh, let me look back and see if it's uh, the right. Right here. That's uh, the far right side of the screen. How do I even point to it? You know, boop. Over there in the far right corner. That's where that 18 foot hole is. And over there, it is rock solid. As soon as you hit the edge, I sort of like, damn it. Why is the spot I want to fish? Not gonna work out when I have time to get there. And you may run across, across this all the time. Things won't work out. Maybe it's not safe. And speaking of safe, that's another topic I wanted to talk about in this video. A lot of people are going out ice fishing right now and maybe they don't, how, don't know how to measure the ice. They don't know about the prerequisite of having four inches of ice to be completely safe. And this is four inches in the middle of the body of water, not on the edge. And how do you measure that? You really have to dig a hole, I guess, or wait for a uh, an official to tell you it's safe. Or somebody just went out there and said they did it themselves, and maybe they had some floaties on so they wouldn't go under or under the ice if they fell through. Also a good thing. Um, but once that happens, or you think it happens, then go out and do it. But if you're too scared to do that, there are other ways to go ice fishing, and that's the way... I plan to do it. I don't have time to be sitting on the ice and waiting that long because we as fishing network people and people with less time to go fishing have to use our time effectively and constructively and sitting out on the ice, which it would be fun to do for a while if you had some, some beers and a heater and a tent and everything to keep away from the cold wind, you can hang out there all day. And if you have that time during the weekend, awesome. But if you don't, like on a regular day, you can still go out there the same way I've taught you in a 10 step process to go fishing at work PDF. And how you do this? You go fishing by the dock, but not at the bay. You do it at your local pond, your local lake, even the river that freezes over. There are docks that you can walk out to, usually they're not blocked off. Even though some places they feel like some idiots will go out there and drown and then they'll have to like uh, save them or something. But uh, stay safe. You stay on the dock and the water's right there, frozen in front of you. And the there's probably fish right below you. They're always under the dock, especially if it's deep. I'm talking like eight f plus feet under the dock. Mm, yeah, there might be some panfish under there and you can do some panfish ice fishing. So you do... The exact same thing that you would do if you were a nice fisherman out in the middle of the water. If you have an auger 
or a hand one or a motorized one, you just dig your hole right there, you go fishing. You put a tent around you and you have a hard base, not just the cold ice to actually sit on, put your chair up, grab your beer, grab your hot cocoa, get your tea, whatever thing you like to drink and you know, do your fishing and get moving on. If you're at work, cool, you stand there and you can, if it, hopefully it's not thick, you can just drop a rock or something and break it and it's like a light ice that's not safe to, to actually uh, step on and go fishing like that. And that's what I plan to do because where I'm going it doesn't get too thick if I had a big rock or I could bring a handheld auger. You know, you can stick that in your backpack. They do have those. You don't need a big hole that's big enough for a fish to come through and you can fish like that. It could take a little time and maybe it would be better off if you actually dug the hole one day and went fishing the next because the next day it will be it will be weaker possibly. Um, not really an expert of like digging a hole and keeping it that way but if you had time to go by that spot in the morning you go in the morning you can dig the hole you can uh, make it nice and wide leave for work come back during your lunch time or even after work and if you have to redig the hole it's it's much weaker and it will be really quick or the hole still open because the sunlight from the day will actually melt that um, lighter ice and keep it um, open longer, which is a good thing. So, yeah. never mind my face here, but uh, that's what I did. I, I cast it over here, I cast it over there. It was really shallow, it was like five feet or less, and I was getting caught in the edge of the ice, and the hook was getting caught in the edge because it was all jagged and it was ripping my little worm to pieces. And I was like, did I get a bite or did I just get caught in the ice? I didn't really know. This is what happens when you fish on ice at a distance. You want it directly below you, just like everybody else does their ice fishing. Um, with safety, I found. Let me check if my uh, video. Oh no, if my video has uploaded yet. I think it closed out. Uh, why is it so hard to check? Wait, I can check right here. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if it's uploaded. Yes! Ice fishing on the Charles River Broad Canal fail. Check this out now. If you didn't check this out beforehand, go back and hit up this video. Hello, this is Dwight Norris of FishNetwork.com here on the Broad Canal, right next to MIT and Cambridge. See that? Thinking about doing some ice Frozen. Well, I walked here and this is what you got. It's like a skating rink. You can actually see how thick it is. It's at least four inches, which is, which is the minimum for, you know, doing your ice fishing or skating or even driving out of a car or a truck on the ice. So this bad boy is solid. So yeah, solid ice right here in the Broad Canal. If you can look at my a previous video about 10 to 12 episodes ago, I was fishing here, nice smooth water. The only bit of ice was at the very end, right where the kayak, um, I think it's called the Charles River Kayak and Canoe like Rental Center. They have several of them on the Charles River. You can rent them for a yeah, you know, a decent price and have some fun. But uh, this is one of the spots I was at. I'm like, oh man. And here's what's even funnier. I actually came here thinking I was gonna fish. And then after I realized it was iced over, I was all bummed out. I was like, oh man, I just rode the uh, you know the, the subway over here and then wasting my time at least I could do is make a video and then I thought for another second and I realized <laughs> I left my worms at home that was the a double negative double stupid I'm like oh come on man you're s slipping slipping don't make that mistake so when you leave your house you get prepped Make sure you have a list or you have like some kind of notification on your phone. Did you get all of your fishing gear? Do you have your rod? Do you have your reel? Do you have your gloves? Do you have your, your, your wipes to um, get the stinks off your, off, your, off your hands or wherever else that fish slaps you with once you get it out of the water? Um, do you have all your warm gear? Do you have your bag to carry all the stuff? If you're actually keeping a fish and taking it home, do you have your carry or uh, whatever type of sealed device or sealed bag 
to do that with so that it won't get slime everywhere, you won't smell it, and etc. And obviously, do you have your bait? Do you have your lures? Do you have some line? And all this stuff is like, I'm saying a lot of things, but all this fits into a very small package. But if you don't have one of these things, you will, depending on the environment, you will have, you know, problems. Problems that you don't want to have when you're out in the cold when it's 25 degrees. So be prepared. But I did a little adventuring. I went to those other parts of the Brock Canal where the two roads well, the uh, the road crosses over, and there's two different bridges there. And underneath them is a bunch of bread pilings in a in a pathway that goes out into the Charles River. And I was thinking, I was like, oh man, when the um, the heron come in, they probably swarm in there and get lost. And the striped bass probably wait outside that thing. And when they come back out again, then they just, they just thrashed them. I've seen the same thing, or you probably have when there's a um, there's plants that make energy or something and they have to expel all the hot water they've used to cool something off some process of the manufacturing of the heat or whatever whatever thing they're making and they push out a ton of hot water for I don't know half an hour an hour or more and that gathers all the fish all the bait fish because they love that warm water it feels good and it gets them active again because they're, they're, they're cold blooded and then the stripers are waiting right there because all the fish are congregated and they can just swoop through them like crazy, like just like the tuna do. I believe dolphins do the same thing. They actually go after schools of bait fish and they, sp they swim around them and they make the fish make a very tight swirl and then they just dive bomb them for a while. I think the bass do the same thing, but the same thing happens when this is more of a... Um, What's the word I want to use? Hmm. Anyway, they're trapped. And the only way out is out to the hole, and the fish know that. So let's check this little section here. It is really nice, but as you can see here, it's all rock solid. And here are the, uh... There's a bridge. You can't call them bridge abutments. They're kind of like bridge pilings. It's a, it's a, it's a pathway in between the two bridges. And when they, they post, post these things, things up, back, back in Virginia, Virginia, a lot of catfish, bass, oh. and all the panfish, panfish would group up under, under these poles here. here. And, and I really, really wanted the fish, but, but it takes a little bit more time, time to get over to the side, they were traffic, because there's, there's a road here. And, but I really wanted the fish along this. Maybe I get some of the guys here on the bridge here. And that's the subway I actually take over. I'm physically on that train. It goes to the MIT stop. You get off. You walk over here. And you go fishing. It's fantastic. Fishing accessibility in your major metropolitan areas is abundant. And you should take advantage of it. It's right there. If you're living right next to the water. Like. Or, wor or working right next to the water. Like all these people here. Hello, there's fish in these waters, baby. What are you doing? Are you watching TV? Are you watching Netflix? Are you hanging out at the bar? Are you sitting like a, with a glum look on your face while you're at your work? Wondering, hoping, wishing. Man, I wish the weekend would come so I can go fishing. Oh man, I gotta cut the grass. I gotta take out the trash. I gotta clean the car, I gotta wash the car. I gotta pay these bills. I have to go see that person about something. You gotta see the insurance agent. You got to take your kids to their activities. You have to participate in activities. Wait a minute, what happened to my time to go fishing? Saturday's gone, Sunday's gone, Monday comes, and you're even worse than you were on the Friday when you were so hopeful that you would go fishing again. And here you are, right in front of the water again, with that same question. How do I get to the water? When you would ask a kid this, hey, this might feel like it's a dumb thing, but I'm gonna ask you a kid, how can I go fishing in that water right there? 
And the kid would say, you walk over there and you go fishing. At this point, you would do one of two things. You would call an idiot, like, I can't do that, I gotta go to work. Or two, you'd slap yourself and see reality the way it is. It is that simple. But you need to have something called self-management. I've defined it in my 10-step process to coefficient at work PDF as time management because that's what people call it. But nothing is time management. Time is, is finite. You get 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 12 months a year, and then you live for a certain amount of years. And that's it. Everybody gets this and everybody uses it the way they want it to. Some people use their time more effectively and get to their goals. And other people don't. And people who don't, don't get what they want. They're sitting in their office, staring at the water, not going fishing. So what you need to do is to manage yourself. What are you doing that is preventing you from doing this? A simple thing. Because you do have time. If you look at it in a constructive way, hour per hour, maybe even half an hour per half an hour, you'll find out that there are points in your day, probably a lot, where you aren't using your time effectively. Or you just have time and you decide to do something else which you think is a higher priority. And that's when you need to stop and ask yourself, is this a higher priority than this other thing? Which may be fishing, which may be hanging out with family, which may be hanging out with your friends, which may be taking out the trash. What's more important? And obviously you should rank things of higher importance first and do those things because they will give you a result that you're looking for, a greater satisfaction, um, a better relationship, more money in your life. And those are the things that are important. And if you aren't prioritizing those things first in your life, then your life will pass by just like time will. Time's not going to wait for you. You're not going to buy more of it. That's impossible. All you can do is utilize your time the best you can now. So leverage your time effectively. If you don't want to do this thing, maybe it's more important to do fishing and get somebody else to do that other thing. Maybe you can do it later. Maybe you can ask somebody for some help to leverage them. Maybe you can get your children to do something that you were going to do and you teach them a valuable thing and you spend time with them and you can all go fishing and you can all have fun at the same time. A win-win. Think of it. Think of that. Fantastic. Um, so, to finish this off, I found a nice PDF made by, um, I think it's called Boat and Water or Fishing and fish and Boat. Fishingboat.com. Never heard of them, but they have this cool little PDF they made called Ice Fishing from Docks, which is exactly what I was talking about. Fishing more safely for ice fishing. There's no danger, really, I guess, unless the, the poles on, the, on this dock break and they fall in the water, but that's not going to happen. This thing's been here for a long time. It's well built by great people, and if you see, they have their augers here, and all they have to do is dig their hole, sit on the edge of the dock, or they can, you know, they could actually sit on something that's not ice. But this might be a waterproof Carhartt gear or Gruden's or something super cool. And they can just sit here and then go fishing. Get their stuff out. They can build like a little net around them. I mean, uh, not a net, um, a tent. Block the wind, but it looks like it's not a windy day. And go fishing. It's safe. And if you read here, the avid anglers seek out methods and places to go fishing year round. In winter months, this can be challenging if safe ice does not form or last long. Some places aren't super cold like Canada, and right now here, it is rock solid, but as I told you, it was 60 degrees, not but a couple days ago, and everything started to melt, except where I wanted to go fishing. Hmm. But it can be dangerous. What looks thick could not be thick just a couple of feet away. You can jump on it over here, and over here, if you jump on it, you're going under. Not safe. So, if you want a surety that you can go fishing, particularly ice fishing, safely, fishing from a dock or a pier or something of that like that hangs over the water, 
is one of the safest ways to go ice fishing. And I really, really like this option. It's fantastic. I'm not an avid ice fisherman, but this is a real solution for thin ice. These guys are doing it right. You know, there's crappy, there's panfish, there's bass. They have tips here. Check this place out. I guess it's what, what's it called. Get more uh, information from fishingboat.com at ice. You can go there yourself. And they also have some handy dandy information about ice safety and ice safety chart, which teaches you about fishing on ice if you actually want to go out there or even do this. So. This is the exit, as you see. <laughs> the whole river is frozen. Fantastic. And right there is the ocean. Part of the ocean is frozen too, but you can't see that. So, this is what I had to say about pan fishing, panfish ice fishing. I will be doing it. I believe the weather will be more formidable. There will be at least the capability of me breaking ice on the Broad Canal and actually going fishing. I'm thinking about bringing a big rock. Or maybe borrowing an auger from somebody I know and trying that out. Trying it out. Because I believe I can still catch fish even when it's frozen. And you'll get to see me doing some ice fishing. Some real life ice fishing. Not just cold water fishing on the Broad Canal. But actual digging a hole, um, ramming a hole through the water and going fishing. And not breaking my reel this time. So... This is Dwight Norris, FishNetwork.com, Tell you to get your panfish ice fishing on and do it safely if you can. Otherwise, use your experience and talk to your local authorities on ice death to make sure it's safe for you and your friends to go fishing.